Hi, I'm Tom Long. Welcome to Island Meditations, where we enjoy meditating on God's Word while enjoying views of God's creation. This is a very windy day here on Oak Island in North Carolina. I'm at Veterans Park, one of those cute little pocket parks that you find in the small communities along the coast of North Carolina. And this one, of course, is to honor the veterans who have served in the armed forces of the United States. Now, we are in the 26th week, or coming up on the Sunday of the 26th week after Pentecost, and we are going to be looking at the very, uh, well, not the very end, but we're getting near the end of the book of Hebrews, and it is, I believe, our last reading in the lectionary for this year from the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to have to handhold my camera to show you the views as we enjoy this park because of the wind. I've already crashed my drone and tipped over my tripod, and uh, it's, going to, it's, it's a blustery day, but it's still beautiful. So let's just enjoy the views as we think about God's Word and what it means to us today. Thank you for joining me. Let's walk and think. In the first century after Jesus came to earth, his fellow Jews would have been very familiar with the role of the temple priest and the rituals of the sacrifices they offered. The epistle of Hebrews spoke especially clearly to that audience as it contrasted the role of earthly priests and sacrifices with Jesus as both our priest and the sacrifice for our sins. Our lesson this week begins with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, shifting to talking about Jesus here, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Old Testament system of sacrifices offer a frame of reference for understanding the sacrifice of Jesus. But the difference was that once God's Son had been sacrificed for our sins, no further sacrifice would ever be needed. The sin in our lives would be covered by that one sacrifice, not just for that generation, but for all generations to the end of time. And now we are in that in between time, as Jesus waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Verse 14 is one of those hard to translate verses that describes the position not only of the first century church, but of believers today. In Greek, to be made perfect doesn't carry with it the idea that we are made flawless, but that Jesus has completed his work in us in the sense that he need not ever offer another sacrifice. Our fate, if you will, has been sealed. But that verse concludes the believers in this age are those who are being made holy. No more sacrifice is necessary on the part of priest Jesus, but we are still a work in progress, those who are being made holy. In the last section of this week's reading, the Bible gets instructional as to how we ought to behave in order to grow in holiness, or as churchy people put it, our sanctification. Verses 19 through 21 summarize what has been taught in detail about Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, the two key words here are therefore and since. 
You may have heard the old saw. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to stop and ask yourself, what is therefore? Therefore and since tell us that the Bible is shifting here from telling us what Jesus has done for us to telling us what we should do. The Bible says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So, what are we to do? By faith, we are to come near to God in full confidence that Jesus has opened that door for us. We are to hold on to hope, which is confidence that God is faithful. Isaiah 40 verses 30 through 31 says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. <laughs> in some cultures like ours in the United States where I live, it's easy to assume that we are talking about personal piety because we're an individualist society and that this personal piety could happen in isolation from other believers. But the Bible now exhorts us to consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. I'm not a big sports fan, but Caitlin Clark's transition to pro basketball really caught my attention this year. As a college player at Iowa, I was impressed by her poise and her deadly accuracy banging away three-pointers. But when she joined the WNBA's Indiana Fever, a fairly mediocre team, frankly, something truly amazing happened. Their new star was not only set setting records for three-pointers, but for assists. An assist is when you give up the ball and pass it to someone in a better position to score with it. And the more she gave other players a chance to use their skills, the better they seemed to play. By the end of the season, the team even made it into the playoffs for the first time since 2016. The Bible says that the church should work together like the Indiana fever, spurring one another on toward love and good deeds. Love is the foundation for everything we as Christians and everything the church should be and do. Good deeds can only be built on that foundation of love. We don't do good deeds with bad motives. We don't do good deeds to impress others, not even to impress God. We don't do good deeds to get ahead. We do good deeds because we love God and we love our neighbors. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said that the more important matters of the law were justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Or as the prophet Micah put it, to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Good deeds build on love and look like justice. Good deeds look like mercy on those in need. Good deeds look like an unswerving faithfulness to God as we humbly walk with God. Verse 25 states the obvious. We are not going to spur one another on to love and good deeds unless we get together with one another, at least by Zoom or FaceTime such as we did during the pandemic. The way we spur one another on is not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Instead of looking at gathering with other believers as a chance to get something for ourselves, we should look at it as an opportunity to encourage one another as we each move forward in our faith walk. Every person we greet, every person with whom we share a handshake or a smile, take the time to listen and so on. Every one of those people 
carry burdens with themselves and in, the, in their relationships and in the events of their lives. Your presence, your gesture of encouragement, no matter how slight it may seem, may be just what God knew they needed for that moment in their journey. If we all look to generously give one another a chance to shine, Together, our fellowships can be transformed from a valley of dry bones to a community that shines their light of love and good deeds together. I cherish this little video snippet I have of my grandson. My mom had a kitchen stool with a seat that you could spin. He draped himself over the top of the stool, still under the countertop, mind you, and was singing sweetly to himself. Teamwork makes the dream work. Preach it, little dude. <laughs> We're all in this together. Thank you for being with me today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving yourself for our atonement. May your Holy Spirit help us to grow in holiness, encouraging one another, spurring one another on in love, acts of justice, acts of mercy, and faithfully following you through each day. Thank you for reminding us of how much we need you and we need each other. Amen.